Welcome to Longview Conversations with our regular podcasts with participants in global financial markets, whether economists, market strategists, hedge fund guys, fund managers, or geopoliticists. Anyone that's got a good take on global financial markets, we like to quiz them, find out how they think about life, and then find out what their views are in their specialist area. Now, this is the second in a series that we've been doing. We started with Andrew Hunt from Hunt Economics a few weeks ago. Do dig out that podcast if you get the chance. Very interesting. In that, we started to dig into the question of what might break. So clearly, the Federal Reserve has been raising rates aggressively, along with a ton of other central banks around the world. And we've seen a very aggressive rate hiking path over 2022. And the old market saying is generally the Fed tightens until something breaks. So the question is, what might break? And that's what we started talking about with Andrew Hunt. His view, the dollar credit system over in Asia, in particular, some key things he's thinking about in China, the Chinese banking system, the dollar borrowing in that, the dollar borrowing in the economy, how big their FX reserves really are, and so on and so forth. Do check that out. This week, I'm thrilled to have Gillam Tullock with us. Gillam is the founder of GMT Research, an accounting and forensic research firm, fascinating outfit based over in Hong Kong. He's been digging into Asian accounts for 25, 30 years. With GMT Research, he's been doing it for 10 or so years with a particular focus on China. So there's a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss. I think you're going to find this really interesting. I certainly did. Fascinating talking to him this time. I've been talking to him about this stuff for several years now, and I'm thrilled that we can put it together in this podcast. So let's dig in. So Gillen, welcome. It's absolutely fantastic uh, to have you on the show. Uh, Longview Conversations with our full, fourth podcast, following on from our last one with Andrew Hunt on, on China a few weeks ago. Uh, of course, you, you've got a fantastic background. Uh, we've known each other for, for a long time. But, but first of all, let me say welcome. Lovely to have you. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. So, to, so, so, just to introduce yourself a little bit, um, you, 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 you've had a, a career as an analyst in mostly in Asian markets. I think it'd be fair to say over, I guess, sort of coming up to thirty odd years, maybe a bit longer. Uh, Casanova, we we worked at, uh, at Casanova at the same time, although I don't think our paths cross much. Uh, you've worked at um, where CLSA, uh, Forensic Asia. Uh, Nomura as well over, over the course of 20, 25, 30 years. Talk, talk us through your career. That, that'd be fantastic. Let, let, let's, get, let's help people understand where you're coming from. <laughs> um, well, so I was hired out of university by Casano back in <clears throat> 1994. And uh, very shortly thereafter, in 1995, uh, they sent me out to Asia. I was clearly not doing a very good job in the UK office. Um, and I was sent to Singapore for three months, then I was off to Thailand for two and a half years, which was a great time to be in Thailand, because when well, it was 95, you had the latter stages of the bubble in Thailand, and then you had the, the Asian financial crash, which sort of, you know, began to, it all began to unravel in 95, but by, you know, July 97, um, the bark devalued, and that was when, uh, you know, the mess had to be cleared up. So I stayed there until August 98, which was incidentally, I think they, that's when they pretty much shut down the office. It was when the, uh, um, of course, it was when the stock market trough. bottomed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was uh, shunted with Casano uh, down to Singapore to cover uh, regional telecoms, which was obviously another bubble in the making. Um, and I stayed there until, I was in Singapore for, for three and a half years. I, I jumped ship from Casano to Namura. I was sent to Korea. Um, so I spent a year at Namura before I got into a bit of trouble in Korea. Uh, um, I was setting a, a Korean telecoms company, and um, I then. How, how did you uh, upset regret, them? What, what what did you do to upset them? Um, I was critical of management, uh, and obviously you're not allowed to do that uh, when you're on the sell side, in particular if you're on the sell side in Asia, and especially if you're on the sell side. In career with an age, right? I think you have to very much toe the party line. And it was mild criticism saying that they failed to assuage investor concerns as to why costs rose in the fourth quarter. Uh, right. But that um, it uh, sounds was pretty apparent. modest. They're pretty <laughs> modest, I thought, yeah. But that that um, got me on the bad side of career telecom. And I think I'd done one or two other things that hadn't endeared myself to the management of, of uh, Nomura. Well, 
were Nomura, were Nomura uh, brokers to that Korean telecom company, or did they do a lot of corporate finance work for them? Funny that, yes, they uh, they did. Right. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that the the two uh, instances were connected in any way, shape, or form. Of course not. Um, <laughs> and then I, I regrouped and I joined CLSA in late 2002 in in uh, Thailand. And uh, you know, I, I, I eventually I was there from Thailand for five or six years. Became the head of research, and I left in late 2007. Um, went to Hong Kong, um, and I. It's in, in March 2008, so I, I've pretty much been in Hong Kong ever since. So I was on the buy side for a very short stint, about a year and a half before I joined um, Dr. Jim Walker to sell up Forensic Asia. And that was in 2009. We passed away in December 2013, and we, we then set up uh, GMT Research in early 2014, and I've been there ever since. And um, since COVID struck in, in well, we left Hong Kong in April 2022 when it was became quite obvious to us that the government were, were making political decisions uh, not based, um, you know, not scientific ones uh, with regards to dealing with the fallout from COVID. And so we decided to temporarily relocate out of Hong Kong to Thailand and the UK until they came to their centres. And we hope to go back quite soon. Fantastic. So great career. So all all over Asia, it's quite it's interesting what you say about Namur and, and and not that the two were connected as you say, uh, of course. Um, but it but it tells you a lot about I suppose a lot about where you've got to where you are in terms of, um, in a sense you have a, a a sort of accounting cynical hat in a lot of what you do. You've seen the sell side, and maybe cynical is the wrong word. Maybe it's just a a real a real a, a dose of realism. But um, but 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 it always reminds me that you know working in this independent research space, there are some advantages because there is a bias on the sell side. There is a need to some extent to conform when you're when you're sitting in those seats. Do you think that's a fair observation? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I should point out um, that Forensic Asia and GMT Research, uh, you're quite you alluded to it, are both independent research. Um, uh, houses uh, so at uh, GMT research it's obviously it's accounting based um and and yes um I, I think you know even more so recently have uh the sell side at banks become sort of more uh you know under the control of the the investment banking arm because they're the only people that are paying the bills uh so you know Mifid has really I think cut the margins at the broken side and so you, you've seen huge juniorization um and, and whilst uh, you know regulators have set up all these Chinese walls, etc., I think they're completely, uh, completely ineffective. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know who's paying the bills, and you, you you've got to to um, you've got to meet them. But also, uh, to to be to be honest, um, broking a a sell recommendation at a broking house um, is far more difficult, just from a financial aspect, even before you take into account the influence of the investment bank than a buy because a sell recommendation you've got to find someone who owns the stock before you can get them to sell it whereas a buy recommendation you can pretty much you know you can sell it to the majority of your client base and so it's a lot more difficult uh, to actually i think so make you, money off good sell reports yeah because um, you mean you mean basically uh, most people on short sellers who are clients of most of the clients of brokers are, are long only or typically, so they're not going to be, they're not going to sell something short they don't own. Yeah, Basically, that's right. So you've got, got to, they've it. actually got to own it and you've got to persuade them to, to part ways with it. And actually that, if you do start sort of pushing sell reports, you, you have a tendency not only to upset the corporates that you're writing on, but your client base who own it, because it might well be their favourite stock. Um, yeah. I, I, I just think that the, we should all drop the pretense that uh, research departments or investment banks or, or big banks or anything other than highly conflicted. I mean, it, you know, at least then you'd know exactly where they're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good point, actually. Very good point. It's interesting because because the fascinating side of the market you operate on, really, which is, you know, uh, f finding the frauds and effectively finding shorts. Uh, I, I know you do other stuff, but primarily, I guess, that, that short side is primarily where you end up making recommendations or sell recommendations, let's put it that way. It, but, it's, yeah. it's it's primarily where we end up making the recommendations, but it's a relatively small part of what we do. We'd like it to be larger, but but you know, shorting, um, it, it's it's 
it's easier to, to give a sell or an avoid, but shorting, you've really got to have, uh, you know, you've got to have lined your ducks up, uh, your timing, you've got to have conviction, your timing's got to be right. Um, you know, the problem with a, a short recommendation versus, uh, you know, getting a long one wrong, is that if a short one goes wrong, it becomes a bigger problem <laughs> in your portfolio. You know, it might go from 2% to 5%. But, you know, if you get a long one, a lot, you know, if you're a buy recommendation wrong, it might go from 5% to 2%. But yeah. so, it becomes less of a problem in your portfolio yeah. as, it, as you get it wrong. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, shorting is is a very, very dangerous game. And we're, we're, we're quite careful and selective in the companies that we actually go out and say, look, you have to short. But it, it is a fascinating side of the business because um, very few very few uh, people in Asia actually put out sell recommendations. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm gobsmacked at the number of times companies have actually put out official announcements uh, following our research. I mean, we're up to something like 20 uh, official announcements. I even wrote a report on three companies um, and four companies uh, put out uh, announcements denying the research. <laughs> you, like, what, when you wrote a report on three companies or four? Well, I wrote the, the report was on it covered seven companies. It covered seven textile companies. And I said, you know, these three companies look questionable. And four companies decided to put out um, <laughs> announcements on the stock exchange saying that, uh, you know, criticizing the research, even though I hadn't even talked about this. I mean, yeah. they barely got a mention, but they That's decided it. to to put out an official stock exchange announcement. So that that really surprises me. I mean, you know, you know, if you're a listed company, you 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 should um, expect it to get a fair amount of uh, uh, criticism. Um, yeah. But but I think in Asia, um, in particular, they're they're very um, you know very surprised and shocked when it when when someone writes a report criticizing their financials. It's brilliant, isn't it? it? Shows a lack of confidence if you're the fourth company putting out that announcement, doesn't it? Lack of confidence in what you do. Clear, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's almost like the more you do that, the, the, the more troubling it looks. It's uh, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I, I mean, actually, that is a very good point. Um, those companies that have uh, um, pursued us the most aggressively have tended to uh, perform the worst thereon after. Um, the worst company I can't talk about because there's a there's a writ outstanding, <laughs> and well, so I have to keep my mouth shut for five years. A writ outstanding on you, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So I'm oh. just waiting for the 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 right the right time. So yeah, I mean they you know they issue a, a writ just to to shut you up. Um, they they don't really have an intention, hopefully, to go to court. Um, but. Uh, 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 and you know it's very expensive for all parties involved to go yeah. to court. No one wants to go to court, so you know it's fine. We we've put our research out there, so we might as well, um, you know, be quiet and, and uh, let the market do its stuff. Because quite often, once you do put the the information out there, the the narrative changes, and that's often simply what we're trying to do. We don't want to get involved in a war of words with the company. And actually. The company that that um, you know sent us a writ, you know, I I should have I should have stopped writing on them, um, you know, a, a couple of weeks pr prior to that. There was no need for me to have gone out and done it. I'd made the yeah. point, so it's partly my fault. Um, but you know, we do have other companies that have got regulators involved, etc. Um, so I think you know, Beijing Enterprises Water was one in in uh, uh, in Hong Kong, and you know, the investment thesis has turned out. Yeah, right. accurately, is, that, I would say. Is, that, is that is that gone gone towards zero or gone to zero? That stock I don't know very well, but um, it, it's a quasi state owned enterprise, which is always sort of have fairly aggressive accounting. Um, but it, it's it's on it. I think it's a good chance of going. I mean, it's difficult though. It should go to zero, but it's a state owned or quasi state owned enterprise, so you never quite know what the loan guarantees are. Um, you know, the, the company is. In 10 years, I don't think it's ever produced any free cash inflows. So it's still leveraging up. And um, I, it's, we're yeah. unable to work out if its profits actually backed by any cash inflows because of the accounting. So I would argue that the company is simply debt pyramiding. It's raising debt to repay debt, which it can do as long as you know, the market believes that there is a backstop. Yeah, as long as it's state guaranteed, basically, which is which is the backstop presumably you refer to. Yeah. Let let's um let let's get into a couple of couple of quick questions. 
So, and then we'll, and then we'll dig into the real meat of, of, of where you see the challenges. Uh, but, but, but just to sort of get us going, you lived in a lot of countries in Asia. W w which are the best ones to live in and the best ones to do business in? Who, who are going to be the continuing rising stars, do you think, if you look across the sweep of Asia? Who might surprise us on the up or down side? Um, well, obviously, it's so the countries I preferred living in it, that, that answer sort of changed over time. So if you asked me in my 20s, it was Thailand, because all I wanted to do was, you know, uh, play lots of sport and go out and party. And it was absolutely fantastic. Um, but then, you know, I went back to Thailand later on, and it was, you know, my, my 30s, and it was a, a more difficult place to live because you're more career orientated, and it's a very difficult place to do business in. Um, Is it because... I think if you're, if you, if you're a because, foreigner... Because you're a foreigner, and it's, 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 it's a bit of a closed shop? I, I, yes, I think it is the still... Yes, and I was also working for... I mean, I think it is, but from a personal perspective, I was probably, you know, I, I was working for a, a very demanding firm. Um, so CLSA was a very, very demanding firm. And you you literally ended up working, you know, 24 hours, seven. So there's, there's that mixture as well. Whereas working for Casano the first time round, um, right. <laughs> um, although they, they, you know, they, they demanded a pound of flesh as well. It wasn't quite the same league. Um, but, uh, um, and then sort of later on in life, you know, moving to Hong Kong, I, I I absolutely took took to it like a you know a Dr. Walker. I I absolutely love and loved and love living in Hong Kong. I think it's for me it's the easiest place um, to uh, to live and work. Um, you know, it's just got that wonderful mix of East and West. I mean, I, I imagine Singapore. I mean, I have lived in Singapore for three or four years, but not for twenty years. I imagine Singapore is pretty good as well. I just think that that uh, you know, for someone like myself with a you know a Western background. Um, obviously, uh, you know the the cities like Singapore and Hong Kong are sort of designed and catered better to us. Where, whereas, you know, the, I suppose Thailand's not really a frontier market, but it certainly felt like a frontier market. And you really feel like you're kind of yeah. out there. Um, you know, you're you're at the coal face, whereas you're not really at the coal face in Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, now that's great when you're in your twenties and you're full of energy and enthusiasm. Um, but it's it's um, a little bit harder when you're in your 40s and 50s and yeah, you're trying to bring I, up a family and, and get the work balance right. But, interesting. So it's a bit like it's a bit like that development ceiling in a sense. You know, we talk about as an economist, we talk about don't we, that development ceiling for economies never struggling to break through it. I guess you would say that Hong Kong and Singapore are clearly broken through it. Singapore most obviously ex smashed its way through it, whereas Thailand, I guess, is still. It hasn't got that Western style infrastructure. Maybe it doesn't want it, or maybe it just doesn't have it in terms of its ability to generate that kind of environment. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, I'm quite hopeful about Thailand, and you know, whenever I go to Thailand or, or I even go to Indonesia, uh, you know, there's just a, there's so much happening at the at the ground level, and there's some you know really incredible entrepreneurs that are making. Or creating unique business models that that only they could have come up with because they understand the market properly, and and, and you know China I think was was very much like that. But then if the politics takes a turn for the worse, it can really um, change the trajectory. So you know I think Taiwan and Korea kind of you know they got the politics sorted out and they sort of escaped from that middle income uh, gap. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, there are some question marks over Thailand um, and perhaps even over Indonesia. There's been this, this dreadful new law that's just been passed in Indonesia, which which I think is quite a concern. Um, What's that about? What's the new law? Well, it, it, I think it's, um, it, 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 uh, I don't want to upset it. it it's basically, it's, it's to do with implementing a stricter form of Islam. Right. Um, and uh, uh, you know, sort of it, it doesn't seem type law. Is that is that? The and, and and also, it also you know, it, it, you can't. Um, you're not allowed to criticize a sitting president. Okay. Uh, you know, so it, it's just an a certain intolerance is sort of seeping in there, which which makes me worried. 
Um, but Th Thailand, uh, you know, I think they are putting in infrastructure. They're putting in infrastructure all, you know, all over the place. And I think there's a very large middle class that that wants to progress up the the ladder. And so I'm I'm quite hopeful that they're moving in the right direction. I mean, uh, and and I, I, I you know Indonesia. Uh, there, there seems to be a few more problems on the horizon, um, but uh, yes, as I was saying before, you, you yeah. know, if, if if it goes in the wrong direction, something like China, for example, I kind of think that China's trajectory is is very different from the trajectory we all imagined when we came out here in the nineties and the early two thousands. Um, you know, I, I I think we all thought that it would go the way of Taiwan and Korea, and that you would have sort of a more liberal uh, political establishment. Uh, you know, Hong Kong would be held up as a beacon uh, in order to attract Taiwan to join the motherfold, etc. But that's all just that's all just a pipe dream now, isn't it? Well, certainly for now. Well, interesting. So let's get into that because I, I wanted to the structure of the conversation. We're going to sort of top, start top level with with China thoughts, and I'll, I'll throw a question your way in a minute, and then we'll get much more into the weeds of of what you do in terms of looking into accounting in. In, uh, in Chinese companies and, and wider fields. So, uh, I, 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 and this debt pyramiding you talked about and, um, and the whole question about the quality of accounting that, and accounts and individual accounts and companies that we see in China today. So let, let's, get in, let's get into China top level. Um, I, you know, I'm always, I, 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 I've loved studying China as a macro guy for, for a couple of decades now. It's been fascinating. I have a lot of sympathy with with the way you teed that up, that that big picture on on China, and of course people, that, you know, but the argument's very polarized, isn't it? And I think back to the the examples of everyone in the American. I just remember the I don't remember, but I've read a lot about the American experts in the fifties talking about the Russian economy as this wonderful uh, example of how America should do capitalism and how America should run its economy. At the time, Russia was growing at sort of eight, nine, ten percent. For Adam, it, it was a, an economic miracle. It seemed that way to the outsiders. It, there were articles in um, uh, the sort of uh, current affairs magazine about how wonderful the model was. And then, of course, you can wind forward to Japan in the 1980s, similar comments. You, you know it very well. We, we all know it. And Japan seemed to be starting to dominate global, the global economy. And uh, what is it? The famous uh, cost of the Imperial Palace was the lamb was more expensive than California that famous example. And, and we know what's happened to Japan in the last two and a half decades and what's happened to the cost of that land deflating aggressively uh, over that time. So you roll forward to now, uh, China has been the thing everyone's talked about for 10, 15 years. As you say, at the margin, it seems to have changed a lot in the last few years, really, particularly the Z's last term or last four or five years. How do you see it? You sat, sat in Hong Kong for 20 plus years. You've, you've lived in Asia, as, as we said. How do, you, how do you see the future of China? How do you, how do you big picture, how does it seem to you today? Um, there's always parts of the Chinese economy which are going to do well. I mean, it is a vast economy and it's, you know, a vast land area. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I suppose in some ways I'm not saying anything new and I, I think it's going to go the way of Japan. Um, I think we've probably had peak China um, it doesn't mean I don't think that the economy is going to, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to shrink, um, or certainly they won't report it shrinking. But I, I do think, you know, that, that they've got huge imbalances, um, which they, they haven't addressed and, you know, they can't ignore for, for much longer. It's very interesting when you go to the, when you talk about the Soviet Union, I, I used to pull out this chart, um, which compared growth in the Soviet Union relative to the US since the 50s. And, um, you know, the, the Soviet Union never once had a recession um, up until 1998 or, no, sorry, 1998, uh, 1990, whatever it was. Or yeah, 89, yeah. 90, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, 89, 90. And then I, you know, went down by 50% in or, or 75% in US dollar terms or, or whatever. Whereas the US recession had a, oh, sorry, the US economy had a recession every three to five years. And, but at the end of the day, it's, it's substantially, it's grown substantially more if you look at it over that entire period. Um, and, and China's the same in, in many ways, in that you just, they've not allowed, um, they've not allowed the economy to ever, uh, you know, have a rebalance. And so, you know, it's been quite clear for at least 10 years that 
the investment model um, has perhaps run its course and, and it's time to rebalance more towards domestic consumption. But I think they they realize that that's been, you know, that comes with um, obviously economic and therefore political risks and the whole Chinese mandate or Communist Party mandate is built upon the, the idea that, that the Chinese Communist Party deliver continuous growth. Um, so they've continued to kick it down the can. Um, uh, and, you know, having sat through the, the 97 crisis in Southeast Asia and there were all these successes, um, you know, it just pales in comparison when you go to China. I mean, I remember taking the, the high speed train from Shanghai to Beijing and, you know, we looked out the left hand side window and it was just property development, property development, property development. And then he looked out the other window and it was exactly the same for just, yeah. you know, for a thousand kilometers. It was just. It's yeah. just extraordinary. Um, and, you know, we've done many trips. Um, so, you know, we went off to sea in, in 2016 or 15, I can't remember. We looked at 30 or 40 of China Evergrande properties and, you know, they let that company grow um, year after year, uh, you know, to the extent where it, it had, it was the most indebted company, I think, in, in the world. It had a larger, the, you know, a larger interest expense bill than the nation of the Philippines. Um, how do you think they've managed this though because um you know it's you can you it's it's clearly not subject to the normal market forces that you saw in the asian crisis or that we've seen in many of these western crises and there's clearly an ability to manage uh and sort of paper over cracks within china uh how, how do you think they've managed to achieve the the extent of what they've done for so long um, well, because similar to the the Soviet economy, they they have huge discretion to direct resources, um, and so you know credit is rationed, bank credit is rationed, you know they direct subsidies towards certain sectors, etc. Um, so uh, you know whilst there is a uh, you know there is a free market element in China, uh, there's just it, there's a huge command economy as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, and you can see it every time they decide to put in stimulus, there's almost a, an instant sort of reaction as the, the economy inflates. It's, it's um, you know, as they direct it to the areas that they see fit. Um, yeah, so it's so a that, manip manipulated. Sorry, go on. Yeah, so, so I, I think that um, the communists are very scared of the free market, uh, <laughs> which is an irony because they've obviously done so well out of it. There was an edict out of, well, there was there was a, an, a I should say it was a Bloomberg uh, article, uh, reportedly covering some Beijing politician who was saying that they need to come up with a, a framework for valuing uh, state-owned enterprises which are listed because the market's not doing its job properly. Um, so all these SOEs are trading on three times PE, which quite frankly is ridiculous that they're trading on such a high multiple. Um, <laughs> And obviously, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 politicians feel that you know they sh it should be on I don't know ten times twenty times. I mean, goodness knows what they'll come up with, but they're going to come up with with uh, uh, you know a model that analysts can adopt. And, and you can also see that in their, the their the attempts just, to just just to be clear, the government's going to come up with a model that the an equity analysts should follow as the value what the valuation should be for the SOEs, that sort of thing. Is that what yeah, is that that's what right. That's what's being touted. Um, I don't know if it's actually they're going to implement it. I mean it's a fairly fairly ridiculous idea. Um, but the, you know when I look at basically an SOE, no, point, no point knowing markets if you do that. No point, well this is it, isn't it? So if you go back to um I can't remember it was a few years back when in, the, in 2015 or something they were having another stock market crash and and they wanted to maintain the level of the stock market. And they went out and they directed the brokers to buy certain stocks to maintain the index at a certain price. You know, the thing about markets is they're not your enemy. They're just uh, they're just telling you where uh, where there are inefficiencies and uh, you know what what you need. To, they're yeah. delivering a message. You know, the, I suppose there's a reason why um, the, the expression "the the emperor's no clothes" did it not come from China. Uh, <laughs> Probably. So, <laughs> So well, Mark, they, 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 don't like to, they don't like to hear the, the, the message. It's, it's, it's quite sort of, of course, markets, yeah, you're right. They're, what they're brilliant at is price discovery. That's, that's what markets are so good at, isn't it? I was, you know, it, it's like if you, you, 
politicians can have these policies forever. They never really get tested uh, or they might over 30 or 40 years. But once, you know, the market tells you what something's really worth and it's true value and it's thousands of millions of people making the decision. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Rather than a couple of guys in the Chinese bureaucracy deciding that uh, an SOE bank should trade on 10 times forward earnings or whatever it is. It's un- un- unbelievable, really. I mean, it's sort of the, almost the death knell of capitalism in China, I think, if you end up with that sort of stuff. Yeah, so well, this is this is the point that I, I was raising earlier, which is that it, it seems to very much have changed. It's, um, you know, it's it's not about, you know, growing the economy. It's it's all about security. President Xi is not a, he's not a reformer. Um, he, he, you know, he, he wants to cement China's position, it seems. Um, so, you know, China's very much gone a different direction from where we all expect. And, you know, going back to your original point about, you know, where does China go? I mean, you know, if you look at the imbalances, you know, the property sector plus construction, I, you know, I, I keep hearing various numbers. It's somewhere between 20 to 35% of GDP. It should probably be around 5%, um, you know, they're just building weight. I mean, you know, as I, th- I think I mentioned to you earlier, one of, one of the property developers was um, was selling properties uh, and, uh, and it said, well, the property is too small to live in, but it's a great store of value. Uh, so that we've yeah. got to that extent now where, where they're just, they're, they're literally, they're, they're selling bits of rock that you can't live in. <laughs> you can't even live in it. It's an sort of alternative savings account if, if it goes well. Any idea what size that property was off the top of your head? Do you remember? Is it sort of a sort of tiny? It's obviously a sort of bed, a, like a, a one bedroom flat that just about fits the bed in it. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have been. I, I don't know what size it was. It'll be, you know, maybe it was fifty square. Yeah, first of all, I have no idea. Um, I, I remember sure we did a study. We did a study of, of global house prices, compare and contrast, and took some Shanghai and Shenzhen and did a bit of googling on. Uh, probably, you know, five or six, seven years ago. It was quite a while ago. Um, and I remember at the time, per square foot, but firstly, we found that sort of place. It was just bigger than a bed. I think it was on for 150, 200 grand or something like that. Um, it claimed it had a sea view or something. It was it was, it was, was just so small, you could barely um, boil a kettle in it. But, but what we found per square foot is that Shenzhen and Shanghai were more expensive than New York, London, Sydney, you name it, uh, any international city you can think of. And the only city we found that was more expensive was San Jose in California, which of course is where Facebook's uh, based, which I th- you know, kind of says it all, doesn't it? Because y- you know, yes, uh, those cities, Shanghai, Shenzhen, they do have a lot of international business in, but they're not, they're not ram full of international people. There's not a ton of immigration, is there, coming through these places. There's a lot of businessmen that have been going to and fro previously. Um, but yeah, I thought that made the point very well. It's incredible, incredible prices. But, yeah. but, but coming back to the imbalances, because I think you raise a really good point. Um, <clears throat> because I don't, I don't want to make this too much about economics. We need to talk about accounting, yeah. which, is your, which is your thing. My but, thought, but, yeah. Yeah, but let me just make one quick point. Triffin's dilemma. You know, Triffin was a sort of great economist in the 60s, 70s or whatever, who said that you can't control your interest rate, your exchange rate, and your capital flows. You've got to choose two or three, and one of them you've got to lock down. And China, of course, has, has tried to control it, uh, it, it, it's uh, controlled its um, its lockdown, its exchange rate, tried to control its capital flows, and and its interest rate sort of does what it does. Really, I suppose they move it out a little bit, and 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 really you achieve that by building up these massive amount of reserves that allow them to defend their their currency. And I think what's interesting about that, you talk about the imbalances. And I was just, it made me think, when, where's the breaking point? And of course, there's a lot of chat, and I was discussing this on the prior podcast, of, of how real are China's reserves? Are they genuinely three trillion odd reserves in dollars there or not? Or have they in fact lent a lot of them out and allocated them elsewhere? I don't know if you have a view on this. I, I guess it's not really your subject, but I don't know. It's not really our about. subject. I mean, we, we, obviously we you know, talking to people, we've heard that uh, they're not as liquid as they say and that they are invested, but it, it's not something that really we come across looking into into companies. Perfect. Okay. Well, there's an advert for the prior podcast anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but let's get into the accounting. Let's, let's start with the Chinese property companies. Tell me, um, what do you think of the quality of the accounts you see in the Chinese property sector? 
What you- I'm shockingly bad. Uh, we actually we wrote the report on China Evergrande, as I said, I think it was it was 2016. And uh, we said, you know, it's the, the title of the report was Auditors Asleep. Um, PwC audits um, China Evergrande's financial statements. And I hope that they're taken into account for it because when we visited our 30 to 40 projects, which is, I think, 10 percent um, of um, you know, what they had at the time, they're like 400 projects. It was quite clear that um, you know, a huge amount of the, the assets that they claimed to be building uh, they had stopped building, um, uh, or they were building it incredibly slowly. Um, so, you know, we, we were shocked. By, I mean, we also felt that we also felt it was questionable what what the the the, the margins were likely unreasonably high, um, in that I, I suspect that a lot of stuff was kind of being pushed into the investment portfolio. Uh, so, you know, whatever was being sold was being pushed through the income statement, whatever wasn't sold was sort of revalued as part right. of the investment portfolio. So we, we thought it was highly questionable. Um, and have you seen uh, proof since that investment line? Is, have we seen that come down or be revalued? It's, well, well <laughs> uh, so the reason Evergrande became such a large company was, uh, you know, and, and its balance sheet blew out was because it just wasn't selling, you know, its asset turns ground to a halt as assets, the ratio between assets and revenue. Um, so as I said, you know, they couldn't, they could, uh, it seemed like they were unable to sell an increasing amount of the projects that they were finishing, which you would also associate with the latter end of a bubble, a property bubble. Um, and that was that was just just getting sort of stuffed onto the balance sheet, uh, and that's I think really you know, and it was increasingly difficult to finance it. Um, so that that's really you know what, what was ha- happening with, with everything. But you know what have we seen since? Well, most of the property companies have defaulted, and so you can't see anything because they've not right. been able to produce financial statements. And one or two have, and what we're now beginning to see is significant write downs of assets that they had recently revalued. And they'd come under some criticism latterly for revaluing their inventory portfolio or whatever. Um, but the, the account- So criticism from who? From owners of houses? Or from, from-, from some people on the sell side, actually, surprisingly, have actually criticized some of the property companies uh, for revaluing some of their, their inventory, in particular over the past year. But most of them failed to produce their 2021 financial statements. So they were, you know, a, a, a large, I think, majority um, of the non-SOE property companies um, defaulted, were unable to, to, you know, repay their, their debt or whatever it was. And, and so they haven't produced their financial statements. So where, where does this leave us in terms of, of house prices? I mean, if you if it, if, if, the, if the housing property developers are revaluing property downwards or devaluing it, and um, so they're marking lower the price of the property. Um, yeah, and obviously well, we all know it's very very difficult to look at national government stats on property prices now. They're somewhat um, un- unclean, I think, to a certain extent. Where does that where does that leave the people who own these properties? Any sense on that? Well. Um, Obviously, it goes back to what we were discussing about pricing discovery. And the Chinese yeah. government uh, is very fearful that property prices fall because a huge amount of the nation's wealth is wrapped up um, in um, in property prices. You can you can see this with with uh, you know any time Evergrande or one of the major developers has cut their prices to try and clear their inventory. There's been riots at the sales office. Um, so. You would have thought that there should be a significant uh, reduction in, in property prices and to, in order to clear the, the inventory. Um, so what happened if you look back at the Asian financial crisis is that the property developers were massively over leveraged, which is very similar. Um, they were overly, overly reliant on foreign currency. Uh, Chinese property developers, not to quite the same extent, but there are huge problems there, which we could discuss later. So they cut their prices. Um, which stimulated demand eventually. Uh, they liquidated their, they cut, took capex to zero, liquidated their inventory, took the cash flows, and repaid their debt. And then they were away to the races. 
uh, within about you know five to seven years. I think it was 2002, so the crisis hit in 2007. It bottomed in August 2000, sorry, 1997, bottomed in in 1998, and by 2002, 2003, they were off to the races again. Um, but so they, in you, other words, not they clean the mess up. They clean the mess up in the Asian crisis, and then that's correct. Come yeah. A bit like Europe in the in the Euro crisis or Ireland, for example, is a great example of cleaning up its mess, then off to the races five years later. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, you, you've got to have that market clearing process where prices fall, uh, and you know that stimulates people to get back into the market again. Um, they're not going to take that uh, approach. I think. Well, I don't think. I think it's quite clear that they're not. They're absolutely terrified that prices will fall, that people will riot. And so they'll they'll try and maintain prices at the current level. Um, and that means that property companies are going to find it very difficult to clear their inventories. And perhaps they could sell them to some state-owned enterprise or vehicle. I mean, who knows? And I don't really know how that would work. Um, and the mechanics of these things will always take longer than expected. But it basically means it's going to take years for these property companies to, I think, turn their ships around, uh, for them to liquidate their inventories and repay their debt. Um, I mean, I suspect they won't bother about paying off foreign creditors. I suspect that those that own the dollar bonds through Hong Kong or whatever will get absolutely nothing back. Um, in terms of cash, maybe they'll get some equity or whatever. Um, but, you know, that on cash on the dollar, I doubt they'll get anything. And there, there's a problem simply getting money over the border, which is another um, issue that many foreign investors seem to have been blissfully unaware of. You just can't take money out of China to pe repay uh, um, a, a bond. So, I, you know, I, I think I think it's, you know, this is going to grind out over 10 yeah. years, uh, if not longer. I mean, those companies that uh, failed to sort themselves out in Southeast Asia uh, in the, the, you know, the, the late 1990s, you know, you can still see that there are many um, skeleton buildings scattered, or not so many as they were, scattered around Bangkok. Here we are 30 years later or whatever. Uh, and I, yeah. I suspect, well, there's already a huge amount of those buildings actually in China. I, I yeah. suspect there's a, you know, the, the NPLs have been massively underreported. Uh, you know, everyone has gone into properties. You'll you'll find so many listed companies have gone on into properties in some way, shape or form. Um, and so I, I think that this this will will grind on for, for many years. And with regards to the official property prices, you know, there's always been a, a, a heavy amount of scepticism towards that index. And people have often commented that they thought that the decimal point was in the wrong place. Um, so I don't, I, you know, as with all things in China, I, I, I don't think that the government statistics are going to show you anything that re remotely reflects what reality is. Yeah. It'll be what Beijing wants to um you know, what it thinks it can get away with. Well, let's come back to that dollar point in a minute, because that's quite an interesting point. And I know you've got a lot to say on that. Just very quickly, though, think about the inventory of the housing. Um, a lot of it is presumably in places where no one's ever really going to live, probably, if it's excess stock. And it's there must be a, a natural life cycle to this building as well. I mean, surely after 15, 20 years, it starts to just deteriorate. I mean, so what I'm, what I'm saying is assets that, no, it, it, if you built a lot it's of the strongest argument. It's, just, it's, a, it's the biggest bull argument for the Chinese property sector is that most of the stuff will fall over in 15 to 20 years and they have to rebuild it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, so, uh, no, so just, just sorry, just going, going back to the inventory, uh, and this again goes back to the financial statements of the companies. If you look at the inventories, uh, which is work in progress, so it's all considered a current asset. Um, if you look at the Chinese financial statements, it's typically three to five years worth of sales or, or, or you know, and that that's just outrageous because it can only go into current assets if it's going to be realized in the next year or, you know, in the current cycle, which, you know, is surely not going to be five years worth of sales or whatever. Maybe it's not quite that much, but it's it's a huge amount. And so actually, when you look at the financial statements of the, the Chinese property developers, um, they're, they're mispresented. And I suspect that there's going to be um, there's going to be quite a big fallout from this in that they, they should reclassify the current assets. They should revise them hugely downwards. They should probably write off a large amount of the inventory and reclassify the remaining portion or a large part of the remaining portion as um, 
a, a, a non-current liability. And why is that important? Because uh, the financial statements are set up uh, so that you can look at it from a solvency perspective. You look at current assets relative to current liabilities. And so most investors have been looking at the Chinese property sector, or many of them saying, well, look at their current assets. They're absolutely huge relative to their pretty enormous liabilities, but they're still in excess. Well, if you'd actually looked at it properly and thought about, well, those inventories are massively overstated, then you would have you'd have had some inkling that, that it was all going to go pear-shaped. I see. So what you what okay, just so just to clarify, so I make sure I understand and, and, and the audience understands what you're saying is current assets and really include a lot of uh, long-term investment projects on yeah. the one side that make the, the current assets relative to current liabilities look better. And the current liabilities is a lot of ton of debt that's probably got a pretty short maturity date. So it's a it's a goes your debt pyramiding point, I guess. Well that, that's it. So so well, uh, which is Sort of, sort of get, gets there eventually, but but uh, uh, but the auditors the auditors should have picked up on this, and they should have reduced current they should have reduced inventories and reclassified a large portion of inventories um, as a non current asset. But the the auditors are doing all sorts of other stuff. So they were I mean, in particular PwC actually. We, we we saw you know there are they seem to have morphed into uh, organisations which were advising uh, their clients. Um, how to almost skirt the rules, and so if there was a sudden devaluation in the remembe, then the uh, the property developers were, were suddenly able to capitalise foreign exchange losses, um, and they were coming up with with sort of clever ways that you could not recognise the foreign exchange losses through the income statement, um, and so you know the, the accounting I, I I felt was becoming very very dishonest, yeah. but. But also, yes, the financial going, going back to the debt pyramiding, which is very important. It's quite clear when you well, look let's, at the Chinese. Come, let's come on. Let's come on to that. Hold on, just quickly okay. on the foreign exchange, because you know one of the one of the release valves for the Chinese economy is a major devalu. One would have thought, from an economics point of view, is a major devaluation of of the currency, like they did in 1994. Perhaps not as aggressive as that. It was a 50 percent move, but. I'm get, I'm I'm sensing from this, of course, anyone who's got dollar liabilities would. And, and is that primarily the property sector? And effectively, they, they well, they're bust anyway, but they, they would be double bust, presumably, in that environment. Um, it would, sorry, is it primarily the property sector? Is there um, a lot of dollar borrowing outside of the property sector? Or do you know, uh, or is it, I'm just trying to think through the way a valuation yeah. would affect uh, balance sheets and, and- Okay, well, obviously, the uh, from, a, from a, a corporate perspective, the structure, the capital structure is very important with 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 you know how how a um, uh, how a crisis evolves. So um, you know when when we looked at Thailand, I think that the foreign debt component relative to equity was very high. I can't remember the official num the, the actual numbers that we looked at. Um, I, I suspect it was in excess of fifty percent. And so it wasn't just property companies. There were a lot of other companies outside the property sector. Um, had which have got access to foreign debt. Um, I, I don't think it's as high relative to equity in China. Certainly, when we've looked at it, although I, you know, it depends where. So I, I don't think that the dollar liability necessarily lies at the corporate sector. You don't find many A share companies with uh, dollar borrowings. I mean, there will be some. Um, and so, as I said, I don't think it is such a large portion of the equity base. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know if it lies within the banking sector. I mean, we, we just don't, uh, the banks are black boxes to us, so we don't really understand mm -hmm. how they work. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of chat about that in markets, but it may well be in the banking sector. But talk, take us through debt and pyramiding, though, because this is, this is fascinating. Well, so debt pyramiding is, is when, uh, you know, a company... Uh, raises a loan in order to repay uh, a loan. And, and you should always be very careful if a company can't um, you know, repay its maturing liabilities. And most companies sort of keep, keep debt at about um, three times operating cash flow, uh, three to five times. So it suggests that if they, if they get into a crisis, they take capex to zero and they've got enough money to repay uh, their maturing uh, liabilities. Uh, but the Chinese property sector um, has all, has been per debt pyramiding for years. It's it's um, in particular offshore, so it's just raising debt to repay debt, uh, and that debt once it's raised, the initial debt is brought into the com country as equity, 
Okay, so it's brought into China as equity. And the only way you can repay it is by remitting dividends offshore. You can't just bring the dollar debt in as, as, as remembry and then repay it. Because remember, there is there are capital controls in place. Yes, and yeah. so you know, when, when we've looked at the Chinese property sector, and people would always say, well, why do you look at the Chinese property sector um, relative to the global sector? Why don't you look at, just tell us which are the worst and which are the best in China. And I said, well, as you're seeing now, um, you know, they're all going bust because they've all been debt pyramiding. None of them are in a position to actually meet their maturing liabilities, which is why you should have looked at them on a global basis. Because if you look at them on a global basis, you'd have seen that all the Chinese property developers had uh, had leveraged their financial statements up to something that had not really been seen in any other market, and certainly not for, for sort of 15 to 20 years. And therefore, this explains why you know, relatively conservative companies in a Chinese perspective, like Shamao, for example, everyone will say, well, Shamao's gone bust. It, it's actually one of the most conservative ones. Well, yes, in a Chinese con you know, a perspective, but on a global perspective, it just, uh, you know, it, it, it looks like it's way out there. It's, it's way too highly leveraged. It's reliant on dollar debt. It, you know, it, it yeah. probably doesn't have enough profits domestically in order to remit the capital offshore in order to repay its debt. So let's just go back to that, that initial initial statement. So you, you they've borrowed, borrowed, borrowed dollars offshore and they bring they bring it into China and, and bank it as equity. So, but what's, therefore that leads to the question: Why do they, why do their accounts show dollar borrowing if it's actually then becomes equity in their accounts? Well, so so the financial statements are consolidated, and so um, it will show up as dollar debt within a property company's uh, balance sheet. But from the government's perspective, um, you know, because it doesn't. You know, it does, doesn't uh, it, it include Hong Kong's financials. Presumably, the money is coming via Hong Kong, but Hong Kong is not included in the national statistics, etc. Um, so it's coming into China as 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 equity. Um, but but you will see it within. You can quite clearly see it within a, a property company's financial statements. It'll be clearly detailed in the notes of the accounts. Um, so right. yes, it's, it's entering the country though as an equity investment because you can't just bring money into the country. So, so when you look at Chinese accounts for property developers, that dollar borrowing has become equity in that account. It's perhaps dollars in the Hong Kong account. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, if well, uh, if you're looking at the consolidated accounts of a Chinese property company, it will appear as it will appear as a dollar debt. And you won't know anything about the, the, the equity coming in because they, you know it, it, it's all included within the consolidated financials. If you were just to take the uh, the Chinese financial statements, yeah, it would look like an equity infusion, right? So the equity so base excluding, looks stronger. excluding the Hong Kong portion. So you know you've got a Chinese property developer, the consolidated accounts in China and Hong Kong, but let's just say you looked at the Chinese portion of that. Um, it would be an equity infusion. But but if, it, if I'm thinking in terms of national accounts and GDP for China, well, it should so the therefore will be equity. consider it's an equity, uh, an equity investment. Right. So it'll, it'll, it'll be, yeah. Yeah. So, so they're borrowing dollars to repay dollars, basically. And you can show this because of the amount of leverage and you can show it by looking at the accounts, essentially, and digging into the detail. Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. And how do you do that? You do you show that by the fact that not you know, the cash flow is not matching up the P and Ls and all sorts of things, presumably. Well, no. So what do you do if you if you were looking at a Chinese property developer? You simply go to the note on debt, and they would detail exactly, um, you know, what percentage of the the total debt outstanding is dollar denominated. So there's no there's no mystery. There's no one's denying it. Uh, there's no secret. It's there in black and white. Companies are you know happy to answer it, et cetera. Um, but but you know they're quite good at disguising the uh, uh, the impact you know the the impact on the financial. So you know if the remember the values as I was saying before a few years ago, what would happen is that you know you would normally expect the foreign exchange loss um, relating to the dollar debt to go through the income statement, but instead they would capitalize it, um, or or it would suddenly it would just sort of wash out somewhere. Uh, yeah. as a as a a foreign exchange translation loss that wouldn't go through the income statement um 
but they would uh, they would obviously have the benefit of 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 lower dollar interest rates relative to you know it might have cost you know two or three percent to raise a dollar loan, but if they did that domestically, it'd be five or seven percent or something. Yeah. So okay, so let's broaden it out a bit. So um, I mean, Chinese property developers at the heart of the indebtedness. Uh, completely concur with your 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 thoughts. Twenty five to thirty percent of GDP is property related, directly or indirectly. And that whole investment model of China, like you say, is it's it's uh, it was too much investment as a share of GDP, uh, and it's peaked. And and China is trying to find a new model, but it's struggling. But if you take these property developers, then you expand the accounting outwards. You know, um, you and I have talked before about the factoring idea. The other leverage that's hidden in the system. Can you talk more more broadly about accounting issues uh, beyond yeah, it's, just the well, it's what we just what we describe as, as hidden uh, or undisclosed debt. Um, so, as you know, debt in China, bank debt, traditional bank tra- debt is is uh, rationed, and it's very difficult for companies to get hold of it. And so, um, what we have seen is an increasing number of companies relying on supply chain finance on both sides of the balance sheet. So what they'll do is, if you're an Apple supplier, let's say, is you'll get Apple's receivables and you'll sell, um, uh, you know, um, you'll sell that receivable into the market in order to get the cash um, quite often early. Now, and you'll get 90, 95% of the cash or 85 That's right. It's numbers. very difficult to work out um, the costs because it depends on the quality of uh, the underlying receivable, the duration, and um, you know a number of other factors, yeah. etc. Uh, so, so it's it's quite difficult to calculate. But so you've got the receivable; they will sell the receivables. But the other end, what they'll do is they'll use a the supply chain financing program to extend their payables. So they'll delay the payments to uh, um, uh, to, to to their suppliers. Now, it makes sense to engage in these. Uh, supply chain financing programs on both sides of the balance sheet. If if it's uh, you know it, if it's simply part of a normal program and you're you're just maintaining your cash balance uh, or maintaining adequate cash flows rather. But what we're seeing is that a, a large number of companies um, are not only window dressing their financial statements, but the sheer magnitude of the amounts. Uh, of debt that are being uh, undisclosed are enormous. And so you see, if you if you do sell a receivable, if you factor, most credit rating agencies would include that as debt when they come up with the debt calculation. You're stealing cash flows or taking cash flows from a future period and you're bringing it into this one. The problem with it is, it's a, it's a bit like, you know, holding the tiger by the tail. You know, you're, 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 if you bring $100 million worth of, of operating cash flow into the current year, when you get into the next year, you start off that year minus $100 million. Yeah. So if you just get back where, where you were, you've got to sell $100 million, uh, out of the next year. And if you yeah. want to grow it, you've got to sell, let's say, another $100 million. So the danger is these factoring programs get out of hand. Yes, uh, and then on the supply chain financing side, what we're seeing is the magnitude, uh, as I said, is uh, is enormous. So you would expect, you know, receivables, let's say, to be 20% of sales and payables to be around 15%. But what we're seeing in China is, is that uh, receivable de- days for the economy as a whole are about double what they should be. So there's a huge amount of hidden debt on the payable side as well. And they should disclose it. So if this is part of a supply chain agreement, they should work out the financing costs and it should be in the income statement. The um, if You occasionally get glimpses of how large this market uh, is. So Link Logis, for example, which was a factoring agent, which listed a couple of years ago in its IPO prospectus, it said that it was the, the, um, the supply chain finance market was around 4 trillion US dollars. Um, so it's an enormous, um, it's yeah. an enormous component uh, relative to GDP. Now, essentially, what is what has happened is that companies, because they can't get access to traditional bank financing, are then uh, pushing it into working capital, which means that it's ultra short term. That means that it's very exposed to any potential credit events. So, for example, if interest rates rise, real interest rates rise. It's difficult, you know. It, it leads to, uh, it can lead to 
um, you know, unforeseen uh, credit events. Um, you know, there could be a government clampdown on, uh, you know, traditional non-banking finance. And so it can, can dry up. And what you'll find is that this debt has to be brought onto the balance sheet very quickly. Um, and companies can get into a huge amount of trouble almost immediately. It's what we saw happen with um, uh, with China Evergrande. So people stopped receiving, they, they stopped accepting its, um, its paper as, as a form of payment. And as soon as that happened, it was game over almost immediately. Yeah. And you've also seen it in more Western markets. So for example, there's a government contractor called Carillion. And as soon as their supply chain financing facility was pulled, the company went yes. bust almost immediately. And that yeah. was not obvious when looking at the yeah. um, when looking at the, the financial statements. So um, when we've done the numbers, as I said, we think it's about four trillion, and, and our estimates are that about seventy five percent of all Chinese companies that are listed on the Asia market are engaged in some form of factoring supply chain program. So it's huge, uh, and yeah. most analysts don't actually include it in their debt calculations. And you find that there's some very big moves in the when you reconstitute numbers. Um, yeah. in, in the gearing level. So you'll find that, you know, BYD, for example, it looks like it is a cash generative. Uh, in other words, it generates free cash inflows. You know, there, there is a surplus of funds to be distributed after CapEx is taken into account and it's net cash positive. When we reconstitute the numbers, we see that actually it is deeply free cash flow negative and it has net debt to equity in excess of 100%. It's a hugely highly leveraged company, which is unable to generate any operating cash flows uh, because it has a big working capital problem. So, it, you know, once you start breaking down these companies, and so yeah. we looked at CATL, which is, you know, BYD and CATL are the two largest battery manufacturers or two of the three largest battery manufacturers in the world. And they're both doing the same thing. And when you reconstitute the numbers, you find out that these companies are really um, not what they seem to be. And this is repeated time and time again yeah. throughout the Chinese economy. That's fascinating. And, 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 and it's BYD, am I right in thinking that's uh, Archer Hathaway's big investment? So, yeah, that's right. It's yeah. their, their, um, fascinating. Um, so, they have a significant stake in it. So, so actually, maybe Warren's picked, picked a wrong one in this, in this instance. Um, Why? Because it's... Happens, where everyone's in, everyone makes mistakes, but but, but presumably yeah, he's thinking yeah. about he's thinking the accounting is is acceptable. It's probably audited by PwC or someone like that. Or well, it's definitely audited by one of the big big four. At least I think it is. But they've actually because it's in the EV space. So um, BYD also makes electric vehicles, not just the batteries. And it's it's um, so it's you know like Tesla, it's gone through the roof. Um, so actually they they're sitting on a pretty pro. I mean, you know, this is this is the difference this between I think being a being cynical a analyst and an investor. Yeah. I, I looked at the financial statements. I'm like, I just wouldn't touch this thing. Um, and yet, you know, it's done very well from a share price perspective. Yes. Well, there was all that dodgy accounting question mark about Tesla as well in terms of credits for uh, for carbon, wasn't there? All that kind of stuff, something like that. I'm, I'm yeah. not an accountant, obviously, although I actually yeah. qualified as an accountant, but that's not my job in economist. But um. <laughs> But, uh, but 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 let me go back to what you were saying because that's utterly fascinating about that factoring because um, it, it made me think as you were saying it. Of course, when you're an economy that's growing very fast, nine ten percent of GDP, and I, I you know I remember going to China 10, 15 years ago, and, and no one talked about the fact there wouldn't be tons of growth next year. Everyone just assumed there would. You remember back 10, 15 years ago, it was almost impossible not to make money if you if you if you set up a business or got going because growth was so strong. And so when you're factoring in that kind of market, and I know it's a smaller market then, it's less of an issue because you can catch up. But of course, growth has slowed dramatically and factoring by the sounds of it has gone through the roof. Um, and I think you used up $4 trillion. And if I think about the economy, it must be what, $15 trillion or something like that. Maybe, yeah. maybe I've got that wrong. I might be wrong on that. I'm, I might be rusty, but um, it depends whether you PPP adjusted or not, doesn't it? So the US yeah. is 21 trillion, 22 trillion. So, okay, anyway, so maybe, 4 maybe trillion is a lot yeah. of money. Whatever the number yeah. is, 4 trillion is a lot of money. And we'll, we'll put the real number up as we're talking now. So it's doubled in the last uh, few years, I think. Did you say that? 
No, I, I, it, I, I mean, perhaps over the last 10 years, I mean, it's growing, it typically grows at 10 to 20 percent. Um, so it, it's growing, you know, at a multiple of nominal GDP growth. Yeah, which is the key point. So, yeah. And it's hidden debt. Um, so interesting. So when, when, when we think about, everyone talks about corporate indebtedness uh, and how it's picked up aggressively in the last 15 years, and a lot of that's local government financing vehicles. But actually, you're saying those national accounts numbers are probably understated if that factoring was taken into account. Yeah, well, well um, they, 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 they definitely, they would seem to be, yeah, understated, not just from that, but also the national accounts. I mean, I'm not sure if that dollar debt, the off, in addition to the factoring, if the dollar debt comes into the country as, as equity, I presume that's not been taken into the accounts as well. Yeah, this um, is always the challenge, isn't it? Marrying, uh, marrying up national accounts, GDP accounts with, with, with individual uh, corporate accounts. It's very hard to know exactly what goes in and what doesn't. But I, but, I would imagine that... Uh, Basically, the, the national account statisticians ask the companies, and the companies are going to tell them what it says in their accounts. So, probably yes, it's understated quite significantly. But um, so if we put it all together. When we've looked at, um, so we used to go through this process of taking all the listed companies and trying to work out, you know, if you put it together, um, you know, what would leverage look like for a typical company? So we wouldn't we wouldn't add it together because then it just looks like a state owned enterprise because um, the the three largest companies uh, in China are the, you know they're just vast. Um, but you know when we tracked crises before, um, if uh, you know debt to operating cash flow for a company is or from for, for a listed corporate sector is is typically three to five times. Um, once it gets above six times for an entire economy, then you're in all sorts of trouble. So Thailand's economy or its listed corporate sector got up to about seven times debt to operating cash flow or debt to profit. That is, it's a similar proxy at adding back non-cash items um, on the eve of the Asian financial crisis. And then it took off again in 2002 once debt to operating cash flow had got down to around three to four times. OK, now China, um, it's debt to operating cash flow. I haven't read on the numbers recently, but a few years ago, it was sort of four to six times. So it was at the, t it was at the top end of that band. Um, and if you reconstituted the numbers today, you would probably think that it had improved because uh, you've had a huge growth in operating cash flow. Um, the debt number it might have gone up or, or whatever. But the only reason it's improved is because all the leverage has gone into payables and is and, and which generates operating cash inflow. Likewise, selling receivables generates operating cash inflows. So, you know, the, so you'd you actually both your denominator and your yeah. numerator would be completely different. Now, this is not something what would, the, the magnitude that we're talking about. It, it's not sort of just fiddling with the numbers at the edges. It would completely change the relationship between debt and operating cash flow. Debt would be significantly higher. Operating cash flow would be significantly lower. So the point I'm trying to say is that the corporate sector is really not in as good financial health as you think it is. Um, yeah. I think it doesn't it's look like it's it doesn't look like it's good financial health anyway. But once you adjust for those issues, uh, and it's I'm all it's. You. It's it's all short term, um, or it's primarily short term leverage, and so it's quite vulnerable uh, to any sort of external shocks. So we so we've got the issue uh, we talked about of um, bringing um, dollar debt in as equity into the corporates. You've got the the factoring issue uh, and the manipulation of um, payables and receivables. Um, you've got the inventory issue whereby your balance sheet looks better than it does because you can't sell stuff and you just revalue it upwards. Um, are there more? I mean, that, that's more than enough for any country. But is there anything else that troubles you about the way big picture accounting gets done in China? Um, I mean, I, I, we seem to be painting a, a very negative picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I know. I'm just that, asking uh, the questions. <laughs> um, well, for for a start, I mean, 
when I look at Chinese accounting standards, I'm actually quite impressed in that uh, the disclosure is better than under international accounting standards. So the fact that we know that 75% of companies factor their receivables is because Chinese companies or A-share companies are forced to disclose that, which they're not forced to do under international accounting standards. There's only some criteria under which you would have to disclose if you sold a receivable. Um, so, you know, it, it's... Um, you know, there are there are bright spots and there are still um there are still um you know good companies um i, I would say in, in china so it's it's not you know there are, there are sectors yeah. that continue to do quite well so it's not negative across the board um I, but i would say that obviously you know there is a huge amount of uh, um undisclosed debt within certain sectors of the economy and it's going to prove hugely problematic yeah, interesting. So yeah, you're right. We've majored on we've majored on the problems more, and of course we started with the with the property sector where it's probably the heart of the the biggest challenges. And there's some brilliant technology companies, obviously in China and and, and other sectors of the economy. Is there is there if you if you um, if you thought about the Chinese stock market on a twenty year view, is there in, in their pockets that you would? I mean, this is not necessarily your game, but. Are there are there pockets of positive areas where you'd be happy to commit money and just leave it? I would never just commit money and leave it in the Chinese stock market for twenty to thirty years. I I think it's um well, too unpredictable, in particular. You, you know, I I mean, I'm, I must admit, you know, companies like Alibaba um, look extremely cheap at the moment. But I wouldn't be leaving it there for 20, 30 years because you know, the, the, the direction that the country is going, you, you have to wonder if there's going to be a stock market. Um, or some days I wonder if there's going to be a stock market yeah. in 20 to 30 years um, or, or not a, a stock market as we recognize it. You know, analysts are told uh, what recommendations to, to put out and um, brokers are told what price to buy and sell. Um, and increasingly, companies are being told, um, you know, what profits to make and where to invest. So, uh, you know, it's it, it's not it, it's not necessary. You know, I, I, when I look around Asia, I think there are better places to put my money. Um, you know, I know that, you know, I, I would be quite happy investing in some markets in Southeast Asia um, over on a, China. On a twenty-year view. On a, on a, on a twenty-year view. view, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Korea, Taiwan, in well, Korea, and, and India. Yeah, the Indian corporate sector has its problems as well, um, and and is not short of of uh, financial shenanigans. Um, but uh, you know, I think that you know, I, I think that well, I, I'm, I'm saying that hopefully politics or well, politics have certainly not taken such a dangerous turn for the worse as they have in in uh, in China. Interesting. Interesting, fascinating. What a what a fascinating conversation. Is there is there other accounting issues that we we should have covered that that you think we ha we haven't talked about the VIEs? I know that, um, which 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 Alibaba do do very well. And I'm conscious that the clock is ticking and and we're we're running out of time here. But is there is it worth touching on that briefly? Yes, I, I think it is something that investors should you you know, get to grips with the so the variable interest entity. Um, structure was actually set off, uh, set up after Enron. So uh, it's a way of consolidating a company um, if you extract all the economic benefits from it. Um, so it's a way for foreign investors to own or, or to benefit from the economic rewards of owning or, or investing in certain sectors in China in which they're not actually allowed to own. Um, so uh, so they it's a way, just to, be, just to be clear, it's a way of essentially uh, getting your hands on some of the profit without being an owner, basically, because, mm -hmm. as you say, there's restrictions on overseas ownership of certain Chinese companies and stuff, corporates. That's correct. So the VIE is actually a series of agreements that transfers all the profits from the Chinese entity, which is actually owned by a separate uh, list of shareholders who are Chinese nationalists, uh, or Chinese nationals, sorry. Um, all the profits are extracted to the local uh, uh, vehicle, which is a wholly owned 
uh, foreign enterprise, a WOFI, that is owned by the offshore company, which is listed. So all the profits are transferred into the WOFI before being remitted offshore. And there are problems with these vehicles and that they're not very tax efficient. Uh, and it's clear that some companies have not um, actually enacted the service agreements to transfer the profits from the VIE into the WOFI. And the problem is once you recognize a profit in the VIE, that's it. You're never going to see that profit or the cash that represents that profit ever again. Uh, if you try and transfer it to the WOFI, you'll just lose so much on various tax taxes that you'll have uh, virtually nothing left. Um, and it's quite possible that the chairman or whoever owns the VIE will run off with it uh, sometime in the future. So this wasn't a problem five years ago when most of the overseas, um, you know, the Chinese overseas listed companies were loss making. But now that they're profitable, people are going to start asking for capital returns and dividends. And they're going to find out that many of these companies are just they can't give you the cash because you don't actually own it. It's owned by the owners of the IE because that's where they recognize the profits. Um, so. It's a huge problem. It has been raised, obviously, by the, the 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 U.S. regulatory authorities have had concerns about VIE structures, and I'm sure everyone's heard about, um, you know, the the concerns they've had getting access to Chinese accounts. I think that's a slightly separate issue, actually. Um, but the VIE structures, you know, as these companies begin to uh, make profits, and people, you know, they they expect capital returns, it will become clear that some of them can't return the capital to shareholders and we're going to have an incident. Um, so the great thing about you know Alibaba and a couple of the other companies, so I think NetEase is in a pretty good shape as well, is that you, you know, the VIE is so small that it doesn't really matter and we can track the money being moved offshore. Uh, so actually if you're an investor in a Chinese ADR, the first thing you should do is you should check if there's a VIE and you should check how material it is and you can try and work out where the cash is. Those are the most important things. But of course, nobody ever does it. No, interesting. And it's probably extreme, probably it, it's probably not as hard to do if you know if you know what you're doing. Yeah, you it's just it, a little bit fiddly. I mean, obviously, we keep yeah. a spreadsheet on all the companies, uh, but I'm not here to hard sell. Uh, no. But no, no, uh, no, yeah. you know, no, you, you could, of course. Yeah, you you can do it. I mean, you just you have to go to the relevant note and just work it out. The disclosures yeah. improved recently, but um, you know, it does. You know, it's a bit. It, it's quite time consuming. Yeah. Well, um, talking of time, I think our, our clock's our clock's ticking. I, I, I actually, I want to firstly, I'm, I'm I'm going to thank you in a second. I think it's fantastic. But if people want to hear more, where where how should they hear more from Gillum and GMT Research? What's the best way to go about getting in contact? Just go to our website. There's a, a contact us uh, tab, and you know, fill it in, and they'll send me an email, and I'll get back to you. Fantastic, and we'll, we've we've obviously been putting the website up as we've been as we've been speaking about that. Um, well, I tell you, it's so interesting. I have to say, very very fascinating. I, I as a as a I'm a trained economist and a market strategist, but I also trained as an accountant back in the day at the beginning of the '90s. So I've vaguely followed much of what you've said. It's complicated stuff and fascinating stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I really want to thank you uh, for your time. It's much no problem. Much appreciated. And hopefully we'll, we'll do this again sometime when we see yeah. a few companies falling over over the next 6, 12, 18 months or however long it might take. Yes, I hope. Well, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the property sector. Um, uh, it'll be very interesting if these companies can, if they want to, if they want to resume trading, they have to publish audited financials. And so that'll be particularly interesting given that the accounting regulator has also stated that it's investigating some of the property companies' financial statements, in particular Evergrande's. So, you know, if I was a, an auditor um, covering a Chinese property company, I'd, I'd be very nervous and be quite conservative. Yes, particularly probably if you're an overseas auditor, where you're even more vulnerable, I would have thought. Yeah, no, that's that's true. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, let's regroup. Let's regroup in, in six to 12 months if, you, if you'll come back and um, discuss some more. So thank you, Gilmore. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for your time. Great. No problem.